I've been into photography now for over 10 years, and I have to say that over the past couple of years, I've been getting a little bored, and I felt like things might be getting stale. So over the past year, I committed to only shooting film to see if that would reignite my passion for photography. The first camera that I decided to buy as I went along this journey was a medium format camera called the Mamiya 645. I bought a couple of lenses, two pretty good options to get me started. And as we neared the end of the year, I knew that I would have a little time off work, so I started planning a trip to the Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas. <laughs> What better way to ring in the new year than to go on a little trip? And because I don't care to drive a little bit, I set my sights on the Guadalupe Mountains National Park way over in Texas. So the Guadalupe Mountains over in Texas are the tallest mountains in Texas and also contain the high point in the state. They're also on the border there with New Mexico, really close to Carlsbad Caverns National Park as well. Something else that's interesting is I'd actually bought a new camera for this, and it's the one sitting just underneath my shoulder here. It's my Mamiya M645. At this point, you've probably seen it all around the channel, but I actually filmed this a couple weeks ago. But I bought this camera not really because I needed the camera, but because I'm generally terrible with money. This quick little trip would give me a chance to put the camera through its paces and to get a taste of the open road. As I crossed the border, I stopped at a gas station to, you know, fill up, and I quickly discovered that not everything is bigger in Texas. Eventually though, I made it into the park, and just as I did, the sun began to set. For one time in my life, the timing had actually worked out for me. Knowing that I would only have an hour or two to shoot, I hastily loaded a roll of Portrait 160 into the back of my new Mamiya M645 and started taking pictures. Being who I am, I didn't look at a map or anything, but I did find that there was a short trail located right beside the visitor center. And because I'm out of shape, I thought this is gonna be a pretty good place to start. Because all there is in Kentucky is lots of trees and grass, I was excited for the change of scenery. Lots of sand and cactuses. Cacti, it's a stupid sounding word. I was also pretty pumped that I was gonna be out of work for a few days. So for just a bit, life was actually okay. Since I've been cramped up in a car for the better part of two days, actually happy to just be out walking around for a few minutes. As soon as I got on the trail, I found the first composition I liked, this valley between the mountains. It's late December and I just left the frozen tundra of eastern Kentucky. My journey through the west so far had seemed pretty nice weather. The temperatures have been great, 60s or 70s. But as I'd got to Guadalupe Mountains National Park, things had started to change. You'll notice in a lot of the video clips that there's a huge shelf of clouds kind of descending into the into the frame and along with those clouds it seemed like lots of really cold air unfortunately this would only be the start of my weather troubles for this trip it's called for shadow i moved on down the trail and i also like this prominent rock outcropping composition with this dead tree while there wasn't much in the way of a golden hour we did have sort of a purple hour. The sky had done its best to turn the color of a grape Jolly Rancher, which despite being objectively the worst color of Jolly Rancher, turned out to be a pretty neat sky. And I think with the colors of Portra 160, it kind of looked all right. Ah, nothing like feeling the wind in your hair after three days of not taking a shower. And with the wind, the temperature fell off a cliff. Pretty soon it was as cold as a witch's tit. It's a stupid expression. It's a stupid expression. Why do we say that? Anyway, I noticed out of the corner of my eye my favorite tree named after a biblical character. There were several Joshua trees on the side of the trail. I wasn't aware that these had escaped from their national park, but I was pretty happy to see them. Along with the 35mm 2.8 lens for my Mamiya 645, I also bought the famous 80mm 1.9, which I've done a review of already at this point. That way I could get some sweet, sweet bokeh behind the Joshua tree. As I was fumbling around the edge of the trail setting up that last shot, I noticed a skull. After freaking out for a second, if 
had too many murder cases at this point. I realized it was just a deer or an antelope or a zebra, but definitely not a human. I held a brief memorial, and then I snapped this photo. I kind of felt like a lot of these photos had an African savanna vibe, you know? Which would make sense given the zebra skull. Shot's nothing fancy, but hey, we out here. I really like this choya, which is also in bloom. Uh, it's like a cactus bush thing that makes these neat little yellow blooms. Really a pretty, kind of unique piece of vegetation out there. So, and I thought this was a cool shot. I know a lot of you are impressed with me identifying that as ch a choya. I got a C plus in botany in college. There's more where that came from. Purple Jolly Rancher sky getting more and more saturated. Lots of clouds and the colors were kind of weird. After a fun couple hours of, you know, taking crappy pics, my luck finally ran out and it just got dark. And also, I was freaking starving too. So I decided I would drive back to Carlsbad, New Mexico, again, like 20 minutes down the road, um, grab something to eat. Like I said earlier, this was actually my first time shooting with the Mamiya M645. Bought it on a whim, and I have to say that it was a really terrific experience. The camera works exactly like you think it should. In fact, I already put out a review on the camera, so by all means, check that out. Let's talk about the film that I shot though. I, in this video, I only shot Portrait 160. I spend much time on YouTube or around the, the film community. You'll notice that Portrait 400 is actually the one that gets all the love. I think that's misguided. Portrait 160 is great too, and I, I love those really subdued, desaturated tones that you get with 160. Everything's kind of a, kind of turns into a, an orangish green kind of, I don't know, really cool colors. I think we should make it a thing. I think more of us should shoot Portrait 160. Cleaner and sharper than 400. I like it. It's good. I also think it's a tad cooler than Portrait. I don't mind. I'm here for it. I wrapped up the day with the only way that I knew how, and that was with a rotisserie chicken from a small local establishment. Stay tuned for the next video where we're gonna get on Route 66 and cause all sorts of ruckus. <laughs>
But as I'm driving these roads, I notice there's monstrosity of a mountain off in the distance. And I mean, it's not getting really any bigger, any smaller. It's just kind of there on the horizon. And you can see it for what seemed like hundreds of miles. Anyway, along with the janky fence, I thought this would make for a pretty cool shot to start the day. Eventually I made it to the town of Roswell, New Mexico, which I have to say was very alien forward, big big alien vibe there. I stopped at a gas station to get some finger hats and I was back on the road. It was still pretty early in the day and I was making my way towards Route 66. I wanted to be there before nightfall, you know, to get a glimpse of those sick neon signs. As I drove through this vast and beautiful empty landscape, I reflected on the Electoral College and encountered some cows. These were the only life forms that I encountered for hundreds of miles. Anyway, I took some pictures. I think they turned out okay. Route 66 stretches from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to California, snaking across a large chunk of the United States. But because my wife had said that if I stayed gone too long, she would divorce me as well, I only drove a section of the mother road. As I drove through New Mexico with my windows down, it was well over 60 degrees. But as I continued north, the temperature started dropping really, really quickly. And much to my surprise, I was eventually in a winter storm. Unfortunately, that's gonna be a common theme on this trip. Again, that's foreshadowing. Lucky for me, at least at this point, temperatures were still rather warm. And although it was snowing, the snow wasn't really sticking. Yet. Eventually, I was out of the winter wonderland and I had arrived at my first stop along Route 66. I have to say, I was immediately shook by how dilapidated everything was. Some of the buildings looked like they'd been bombed out by the Germans. And here I was in the famed photogenic town of Tucumcari, New Mexico. After I'd finally learned how to spell it, vaguely pronounce it, I put my camera on my tripod and began looking for photo opportunities. Luckily, I wouldn't have to look for very long. The place looked like a killer's music video brought to life. If there was a place that was peak Route 66, Tucumcari was it. As I pulled in, the sun was just starting to set, making the sky look just... wow. After taking a few shots, the sun finally dropped, and that's when Tucumcari really came to life. No, I don't mean it had anything in the way of not life but the signs. It was all neon everything and I pulled over beside this old famous motel and started taking pictures. Right now I'm currently debating whether or not to use one of these as the thumbnail of the video. Jason beat me to it. There were so many awesome shots to be taken just in Tucumcari and I would have stayed longer, but the short duration of my trip meant that I gotta keep it. Now traveling on Route 66, I encountered another town in rural New Mexico. And when I say this town was shut down, I mean it was 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and Buffalo Wild Wings shut down. Eastern Kentucky on a Sunday morning shut down. But this was high time for me to take some pictures. In all honesty, I didn't think these turned out that great, but hey, we out here. After having got my fill of the little town, I hopped back in the Prius and got back on the road. In the western part of the weird, squared off part of Texas, I found my way into the town of Shamrock. And this place is, holy crap, there's this, there's this old restored Conoco station that is absolutely spectacular. However, despite being such a cool thing to look at, it was kind of tough to photograph. Not only because it's huge, but because it's also surrounded by lots of modern businesses, which 
kind of make for some weird compositions. Seeing the old filling station was really cool, but it also made me a little bit sad. I mean, this was a really clear example of what Route 66 used to be, and I, and I know that I know that at one point there were these beautiful old fascinating structures lining the road, just kind of like buried treasures that you could pull into a little town and find. Now they're so few and far between. Now it looks like the best we can do is have one or two of them restored for a little bit of nostalgia. It's just kind of a bummer, only for the interstate to come through so people can save a few minutes off their drive. I'm sorry guys, that's a bad description of the plot of Cars. But anyway, it's time to get out of my feels. I walked around and took a few more shots. Then I was back on the road barreling through Texas. As I was passing through Texas, on the horizon I saw these little red dots kind of blinking everywhere. At first I thought it must be an alien invasion, but then I thought about it and I figured they were probably just wind turbines. However, I climbed up on the top of an embankment and took this shot with my newly acquired long lens. After that, I was in a state that I'd never been to, Oklahoma. And holy crap, I hadn't really given much thought to the fact that it was actually New Year's Eve. But as I pulled into my first city in Oklahoma, I was about to be reminded. I was in the town of Elk City, Oklahoma, and it was just after midnight. I guess it was New Year's Day now. Google Maps had kindly advised me that there was this giant neon Route 66 sign that I thought looked pretty cool and looked really great on my new role of Cinestill. And as soon as I pulled into the town, it was immediately visible. I pulled over, readied my gear, and snapped this image. While I was fumbling with my camera though, I noticed that there was a cop that had passed me once. And then he passed me again. I didn't think too much about it and got back in my car. Almost as soon as I got back in my car and pulled out on the road, there were blue lights behind me. And I was promptly pulled over by the aforementioned officer. Pretextually, the officer approached me and asked to see my license and registration. And being the astute criminal defense attorney that I am, I asked him what crime he suspected I was committing. He said it was late, he didn't know what I was doing out, and sound like reasonable suspicion to pull me over. And he let me go. Sorry to say that the exchange with the officer had kind of killed my vibe for the night, and I decided it was time to pack it in. But wait, there's more. If you can believe it, this would only be the start of my trouble. I turned my attention to my favorite car camping pastime, which is to find a place to sleep for the night. And while I was in Elk City, I was really close to a much larger city called Clinton. Usually I don't like to stay in cities, but I kind of half hoped that I would be able to pull into Clinton and still find something to eat. Waffle House, anything. Just I, I, I hadn't had much real substantial food that day, like Slim Jims and Mountain Dew. In hindsight, going to the bigger city was going to be a great decision. I, as I pulled into Clinton, I was sorely disappointed that after midnight on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, there was nothing open. So I found a parking lot ate some more Doritos, and went to sleep. Now, when I went to sleep, the temperature was t-shirt weather. The temperature was in the 50s and really not. But while I was sleeping, the temperature would plummet nearly 40 degrees into the 20s. And that's when the weather would start. In the middle of the night at some point, I was woke up because I was a little cold. And honestly, that's pretty normal. The temperature drops quite a lot in the middle of the night, normally. So it's no big deal for me to fall asleep outside my sleeping bag, the middle of the night, wake up and get in my sleeping bag. But anyway, I climbed inside my sleeping bag, zipped it up, and fell back asleep. And then I woke up again to what sounded like a million pieces of sand blowing into my car and tons and tons of wind. I looked out the window and it was snow and ice. And that's when I got a little scared. And in fact, it was so loud and concerning, I couldn't go back to sleep. And to make matters worse, every time I looked at my cell phone, the temperature was getting colder and colder and colder. And now I was cold inside my sleeping bag. At this point, I unzipped my sleeping bag, climbed out, and decided to put my clothes back on. I crawled over the center console, into the front seat, and then I pressed the button to turn my car on. It failed to start. Nothing. It failed to start. And a red battery indicator came on on the dash. I started to get really nervous at this point. The sudden temperature drop had caused the starting battery in the Prius to deplete. This was a 10-year-old car, and as far as I know, the battery had never been replaced. To make matters worse, I remembered that I hadn't been able to find any food on the way in that night, and that it was New Year's Day. That's when the panic started to set in. I, 
I text my wife what's going on, freak out for just a moment, and then I start to collect myself. I immediately put on all of my clothes and climbed into the sleeping bag and tried to get myself as warm as possible, which was easier said than done. I sat in the front seat for a few minutes and tried to figure out what to do next. I look, I look, I, I pull out my phone and I pull out my phone and punch in hardware store to see where the nearest hardware store is, if I might be able to walk to the nearest place. And luckily, there's one just, just below the hill, literally hundreds of yards away. So I decided to walk in and see if I could find a battery. Unfortunately for me, it's still really early and the store's not open. Anyway, I wait outside for a little while and eventually the store opens. I walk straight to the battery section and they don't have it. I mean, they have tons of car batteries, but not, but just not the janky size that the Toyota Prius requires. As I get back in my car and think about what to do next, the thought occurs to me to call AAA. And after I sign up for that membership, they happily tell me that they'll send someone out in a few hours. And to my surprise, a gentleman comes within the hour. He gets there, he crawls into my car, hooks the jumper leads up to his car, and then I press the starter button, and luckily, my car comes on. It's back to life. And I'm so happy, so, so happy. I thank the man profusely, and suddenly I'm back in business. At that point, it's only the treacherous, snowy, and icy road standing between me and a stretch of highway to take me back to Eastern Kentucky. But first, I route my Prius to an auto parts store where I buy a brand new battery, the appropriate size for the Prius. I install this battery and continue back east. After getting out of the frozen tundra of Western Oklahoma, with each mile that passed, the temperature starts to raise and eventually I'm all the way back home into Kentucky. What a freaking adventure to in five days drive all the way from Barberville, Kentucky to Texas and back. And despite all the trouble that I ran into, I had an amazing time. Got to see lots of new sites and made wonderful photographs and memories. Guys, I only explored a section of Route 66. There are tons of other places to see. I can't wait to get back out there and try another section of the road. I'm sure there are infinite photographic opportunities that await. The next camera that I decided to spend some time with was a Lomography Instant Camera, and this was actually called the Purple Saturdays Edition, and, it, and the camera naturally came preloaded with a roll of Lomochrome Purple. So I took this camera with me to Knoxville to see what sort of images I could get. Exit onto Cumberland Avenue toward US 441 South. If you lock your cameras like you lock your whiskey, cheap then I've got the video for you. It's as shiny as Elvis's G-string and it's as plasticky as Pamela Anderson's action figure. Today we have the Lomography Simple Use Camera. Welcome back to YouTube. It's an internet web page where people get together and share videos and argue with one another. Today I'm gonna take this camera out and I'm gonna take some pictures on it and you guys are gonna leave me some comments about how those pictures are not very good because that's the kind of toxic relationship we have here on this channel. So I got bored and I went to the nearest major metropolitan area to me over here in Eastern Kentucky which is Knoxville. Tennessee. Before we get going though and taking some pictures, just a couple things about this camera. First thing we should probably address is the build quality. Being a $25 camera, the build quality is extremely high. That is to say if you think the prizes from Chuck E. Cheese are extremely well built. Like I said, it's $25. It's made completely of plastic. The lenses are plastic. The body is plastic. The, the aesthetic here is a sticker. Um, and, and while I'm not going to say that it's extremely well built, um, it is what it is. It's a disposable. Let's call it a spicy disposable. Like for an actual camera, it's pretty crappy, but for a disposable, it kind of slaps. I mean, have you ever even used Kodak and Fuji's disposables? They are terrible. I got the one with Lomachrome Purple because I liked the aesthetic of the uh, sticker that was on this one. It's this reflective purple chrome situation. Um, and also, for my money, it's as close as we can reasonably get to Kodak Aerochrome. Looks really nice. It's like you're looking at the world through the body of a ditto. You know, because it's transparent. Never mind, I'm an annoying person. Well, they call this the Purple Saturday Edition. In fact, it says it right there on the sticker. Saturday. But I actually tried it on a Wednesday. It worked just fine. Um, sorry, that's a dad joke. If you read the literature on the website, this particular version of the camera is marketed to disco divas and weekend warriors. I don't know exactly which of those categories I fall into, but if you're like a banker or an accountant, 
the camera's not for you, can't use it. I guess that's because of the finish of the camera, it's this reflective chrome, which, I mean, honestly, I think it looks dope, and also, like, it's made out of the same stuff that UFOs are probably made from. This is also Lomography's first oxymoronic camera, um, as it's reusable. And it's a single use, so I guess it leaves you in a point, it's like an existential crisis, right? Do I throw it away or do I keep it? Um, I think this is just a very creative marketing ploy by Lumography to get you to lower your expectations, you know, really, really lower those expectations <laughs> when it comes to image quality. If we call it a real camera, people are not gonna be happy with the pictures that we take. <laughs> Lomography simple use. Um, we know you're not a Leica M6. Um, just be yourself. We love you just the way you are. So getting into the uh, pictures and the footage here. I got to Knoxville and I parked on the top floor of the parking garage. Um, this is a move that I typically do. This is because it allows me nice shots of the city. One thing to note about this trip, um, Knoxville, Tennessee is not a place you typically associate with much winter weather, um, but I will note for the record that it was extremely cold on the day that I was there, which made things all completely miserable. When I say extremely cold, it was like 20 um, with a wind chill. Anyway, I made my way down from the garage and snapped a few shots of the Tennessean theater as I went by. It's an awesome old building, and I would have just loved to have gotten a shot with a classic car, a nice old Mercedes or an old Chevrolet or something in front of it, but it wouldn't have really mattered all that much because the lens on this camera is not super wide. I took this shot as I walked across town. Unbeknownst to myself, because I don't have great navigational skills, I was headed towards the convention center downtown and also the park. As soon as you pull into Knoxville, you can see it from almost all over the city. There's this giant gold ball featured very prominently in the park. Well, I mean, if I wasn't shooting Barney's favorite film, it would be um, gold. Anyway, they call this thing the Sun Sphere, and it was built for the 1982 World's Fair, which was apparently held in Knoxville. I like to imagine the World's Fair as a little bit like a Renaissance Fair, you know, with 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 fair maidens and lots of jousting. I think it's super cool. Anyway, I really like the symmetry of these stairs. I thought that made for a cool shot. But you know what really would have elevated this picture is if I hadn't had my fat friggin' finger in the shot. Um, that would have been super cool. When looking for spots to take super cute selfies, I found the most extravagant flight of stairs um, that I've ever seen. When I meandered back into town, I noticed that the sun was starting to drop a little bit. Um, I thought this would be a good time to see how the precision optics um, of the Lomography Simple Use fared when shot into the sunlight. Well, to be honest, the lens in this camera offers about as much resistance to the sun as a thong bikini. Not that I know anything about that. And when you look through this camera's viewfinder, which may more accurately be described as a bay window for an amoeba, it's really hard to see. But I mean, it's a $20 camera and nowhere is that more evident than with a viewfinder. And I was super cool right there. I had these little, um, I don't know, these little films pulled over the viewfinder instead of the flash. So the camera also has a flash. I didn't use it because I didn't really see any, any point. I was shooting in broad daylight. I kept walking through the city. The sun continued to drop, which made shooting rather difficult. Lots of contrast. And, be, and to be honest, when you got in the alleys, um, stuff was just getting really, really dark. But, all that's to say, shooting was getting a little more difficult. Well, actually, as I was out doing it, shooting wasn't getting more difficult because there was nothing to control, right? The beauty of one of these little point-and-shoot cameras is that there's a, well, there, I guess there are two buttons, right? There's, there's the, the shutter button, and then there's also the flash button. So you can charge your flash, and then you can push the shutter, right? Not a lot of things to control. So even though the shooting conditions were difficult, 
you wouldn't have known it by using the camera because the camera won't let you control any of it. And with the Lomography Simple Uses blazingly fast F9 lens, um, it made the photo as well. I'll let you guys be the judge. And as the sun continued to sink lower and lower and lower, um, against my better judgment, I kept shooting into it. Let's don't kid ourselves here. I mean, you can really see the image quality falling apart with each shot. And some of this can be attributed to the film, which is the Lomography Purple. Um, the Lomography Purple film was as grainy as an early 2000s security camera to begin with, but I don't think the camera and the lens were doing it much favors either. So due to the fact that I was freezing to death and almost out of shots on the camera, um, I started moving back towards the car. And to spot it all, it was a really good day of shooting. I think I got some nice stuff. I finished up down by the river. So I guess the question is here, um, should you use one of these cameras? I think a film camera like this sits in the kind of strange, weird world of the Fuji Instax camera. If you've not watched the video, I have very strong opinions about the Fuji Instax camera. That's not to say it's useless. Um, it's just kind of a unique, unique kind of camera. Um, this camera is really small and super fun. And uh, to be honest with you, a blast to shoot. I had a really good time taking it out and shooting it. And to be fair, got some pretty decent results with it. That the, cam the camera and the lens combo um, shot in broad daylight don't leave a lot to be desired. Pretty good quality images out of it. Um, low light, obviously things fall apart with the F9 lens. The image quality is great. Considering the fact that this thing has a plastic lens, it's not the sharpest lens in the world. I mean, we didn't expect it to be, but it really isn't bad. I mean, I don't think the person that's using this camera will ultimately be comparing it to the Nikon FM2 um, that's back on my shelf. The images you're gonna get out of this little camera are gonna significantly exceed the quality that you would get out of a Fuji Instax camera, and that's where I think the more appropriate comparison comes in. This is a casual camera that a beginning photographer is gonna wanna use. Like I pointed out earlier in the video, there aren't any settings, there's nothing to control, so I think that is gonna lend itself to a very casual, easygoing shooting experience that puts it right in the realm of the Fuji Instax. Comparing the images between the Lomography Simple Use and the Instax camera, um, the, the, the Lomography camera absolutely destroys the Instax. These are much higher quality images. 35 millimeter film just beats the pants off of, even, even with the grainy Lomography film, it beats the pants off of an Instax. So this would be my recommendation if you're looking for image quality. It's also worth noting, that per shot, this is much cheaper. This is $25 for 27 shots. It's a really weird, oddly specific amount of shots that are that are on each roll of film that comes with this camera. And of course it is reloadable. You can put your own film in there as well. But per shot, this is very cheap. You can go to Walmart and buy Fuji Superior film and load into the bottom of this thing. Um, so, I mean, you're gonna be getting um, a significant more you're going to be getting significantly more shots um, with this camera per, per percent than you would be getting with the, the uh, Fuji Instax as well. So it's more affordable. So better image quality, more affordable. Um, and for my money, if you want an easy pathway into film, um, this is probably a pretty good place to be. The camera that I had came with a roll of Lomography Purple Film. That was by choice. There are three versions of this camera. There are the pur there's the purple one the Metropolis one. I've got a video on Lomography Metropolis film that I'll link here. And there's also just a color negative film which offers a more traditional look. Now those are a lot of the really good things about this camera. It should be very clear by this point there are some real significant limitations to this camera as well. Like at nighttime it's just about as useful as a bottle of sunscreen. And, and the, also the overall build quality of this camera is not as good as a Gigapet. But at the end of the day though, this camera is really fun and would make an amazing place to get your foot in the door with film photography at a really inexpensive price. And honestly, I can't recommend it enough. It, it was one of my most satisfying days of shooting that I've had in recent history. 
I'm absolutely gonna keep using this camera. I've already got some really cool ideas for video projects. I wanna get my daughter to shoot her old film on it and see how she locks it. But I'll let you guys know how the camera holds up in subsequent reviews. So if you wanna get your own Lomography Simple Use Daddy Yo, you can click the Amazon link in the description of this video. I've been trying to do better about putting links in the description. Um, not because I love Amazon, but because you love me and you want to help me fulfill my dream of becoming an oligarch. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to my handbook on the corporate exploitation of Appalachia. Also, we're gonna talk about this film. So I live in Eastern Kentucky, which is exactly like LA, apart from in every conceivable way. What we don't have in concert halls, big infrastructure projects, skyscrapers, that kind of thing, we make up for with coal mines, which I guess is whatever. A little inside baseball here, I actually bought this particular roll of film, the one that you're gonna see the pictures from today, back in 2020, back in the good old days before everything went to crap. And if I'm being completely honest, I bought it the last time that I woke up in bed with a sudden urge to pee and also go buy film cameras. A condition that happens to me every couple of tax refunds. Give this video a like if that happens to you. So first, I guess we should talk about what this film actually is. Well, it's a color negative film developed by Lomography and their top secret Lomochrome Labs. I don't, I, I'm kidding, I don't, I don't know if they ha actually have labs, but it is one of three Lomochrome films that they have on hand. This particular film is known to desaturate colors pretty wildly and let you relive that emo phase from high school. It's a variable aperture film, ranging from two to 400. The strength of the effect is supposed to vary based on how much exposure you give the film. It's exactly like the choose your own adventure. At the end, your photos will be contrived and disappointing. I've never shot this film before, so who knows how these shots will actually turn out. Well, that's not true. I guess I know. I mean, I did make the video. But for you guys, it's a mystery. Clumsily loaded the roll of film into my Nikon FM2, and soon I arrived at Disney World. I mean, this old coal mine. I began shooting some sexy B-roll and some crappy photos. I thought these ripples caused by the rain in this pile of coal dust were kind of interesting. I also exposed most of these shots at box speed, ISO 400, because I value predictability and don't like change. Dear footprints. My inner child thought that it would be a good idea to climb up on this coal mining apparatus, but before I did, I took this shot to document my questionable decision making. Not my finest hour here, personally or photographically. Ugh. Before my acrophobia kicked in and I got too afraid to climb higher, I took this shot looking out over the mountains. I thought it turned out pretty great, even with my subpar compositional eye. The mountains here are actually really, really pretty. I hopped back in my Ford F-150 and headed north towards Harlan, Kentucky, specifically the town of Loyal, or Loyal. Best I can tell here, pronunciation varies based on your proximity to a Starbucks. This place looks pretty sick from above. It's where Thomas and all his friends get together and throw parties. I tried to pass a field sobriety test on expert difficulty before I got started taking photos. I was interested to see how the film reacted to the rusty red colors of the trains and the yellow of the sign here in the foreground. I think it looked pretty cool. These shots from the rail yard are some of my favorite photos of the day. There were just some really cool photographic opportunities here. Continuing my tour to Kentucky, I arrived in the aspirationally named community of Colgood. This place is cool because they actually still have an active coal mine in the community. I say cool, assuming that you lock coal mines. Down the tracks from the church, there were the remnants of the Mary Colgood General Store. I really love this view. It's a really cool old building. And just behind there, there's the active coal mine where you actually witness the untold damage being done to the environment in real time. I thought about moseying inside and having to look around, but I would have been immediately shot on sight. They would have got one look at me and realized I'm not their kind. I really like this big metal bridge looking down the train tracks. I'm guessing that the pastor was getting pissed about his people not being able to show up to church, so he's like, build me this bridge, because he didn't want his churchgoers to backslide. And there's your rural word of the day. 
Just before I left for my next spot, I had this idea to try to shoot through the basketball net down the tracks at the old general store. Uh, it's probably a little cliche, but you guys know me, that's what I'm here for. After finishing up in Colgood, I made my way to Ages, Kentucky to my next spot. It's hard to believe that back in Harlan County's heyday, it was actually one of the biggest counties in Kentucky by population. At this point, I'm probably halfway through my role in Metropolis. I think it's pretty natural when folks are shooting film, especially when you're just starting, to want to conserve shots. I mean, after all, you have a fixed amount of shots. But just to be frank with you guys, 36 well-composed, decent images is a pretty good day of shooting. So at least it is for me. Just as soon as I took this photo, I started hearing things on the ridge above me, which is not a good sign when you're sneaking around in an abandoned coal mine all by yourself. It was at this point that I was certain that I was nearing the end of my time on this planet. I was going to be killed, dismembered, and then buried in an abandoned coal mine, never to leave Harlan alive. <laughs> Been saving that one the whole episode. Being the sexy, loquacious hillbilly that I am, I thought it would probably be better to tackle my problems head on and go talk to these gentlemen. So I approached and asked them what they were doing. And it be immediately became apparent they had big buckets, right? And they were picking up pieces of coal off the ground to heat their homes. I couldn't have been more wrong about their intentions. I do find it to be just a little bit ironic that these guys are walking around picking up coal shards from the ground. Um, and that's the only thing of value left in the community after the coal mines have pulled out. My last and final stop of the day was at the suspiciously named community of Lynch, Kentucky. As soon as you pull into the town, there's a big abandoned coal mine with a huge smokestack right in the center of town, and it sticks out like a pubic hair and a bowl of mashed potatoes. Not that I would know anything about that. I turned off the Miley, I mean Bruce Springsteen, and started exploring the abandoned mine. This is super chill. There aren't no trespassing signs or anything. You can just, I mean, walk off the sidewalk from this little community and go inside. So this place was surely a photographer's playground and gave me the ability to finish off most of the rest of this role. As I was walking back to my car though, I got this shot, which turned out to be one of my coolest shots of the day. It's of the abandoned mine opening. I want you to notice how little stands between you and just wandering inside the mine, potentially never to be heard from again. So it's the wild west over here. By the time I finished up in Lynch, I was almost through my roll, only had a few shots left and daylight was fading. What better way to finish off my trip through sunny California than at the highest point in the state, which is Black Mountain. Pristine and undeveloped except for the massive scarring from the coal mining operations over in Virginia. I fired off the last few shots on the roll up here, and honestly they were a little disappointing. The views up here to be the highest point in the state aren't really all that great. So now that we've seen the images, what do we think about Lomachrome Metropolis? Well, I think the first thing that we need to talk about are the colors. The film has an overall pretty sepia-toned look, and I'm actually unboxing the film here for you to take a look. If you, if you look at the back here, it's kind of, it's got this greenish tint. Perhaps that's got something to do with the way the colors render. After all, you look at my shots and they definitely all have that sepia, greenish, brown cast to them. Um, I think this film would probably be better served shooting in an environment where there are more colors. Um, I've seen shots on the internet, reds look great with this film, um, lots of blacks, dark colors um, tend to make this stuff really, really pop. So I think maybe in the actual Metropolis environment, uh, maybe this film will shine a little more. All in all though, I've got a few more rolls here. I'm gonna keep shooting the film. It's really cool. I think that there's some really great photos to be had with this stuff and I'm gonna keep playing around with it. So I miss the Kentucky Derby and mostly just think bourbon is 
okay, but nevertheless, I decided to take my talents to Louisville to try my hand at some night photography. Welcome back to Overexposed, where I like to shoot my videos out of focus. That way I have to do them twice. I load my Mamiya M645 full of Portra 160, get on the road. I do have a goal for this video, and I wanna see how well Portra 160 does it not. It's a film stock that I've been shooting a lot of recently, mainly because I have a pro pack. I thought it'd be interesting to see how this film handled those nighttime colors versus something like, say, Cinestill 800T. But before I could get started with that super special roll of Portra 160, I had a few shots left on my Nikon FM2 of the new Lomachrome Metropolis emulsion. So check some of these shots out. I shot my first few frames of medium format goodness down on the banks of the Ohio River. Darkness was beginning to fall and the bell of Louisville was about to shove off. That's what we say, right? Shoving off. And anyway, all these shots I shot on my Mamiya 45 2.8 lens. And even though I was shooting the absolute slowest form of transportation known to man, a freaking steamboat, um, apparently my film still wasn't fast enough because you see, a lot, you see a lot of motion blur in these shots. So after the bell of Louisville had shoved off and had made its way over into the river, I made my way up a set of steps onto this kind of walkway patio situation. So this walkway goes over the interstate highway and then kind of connects to the back of the Galt House Hotel, which is kind of a famous hotel in downtown Louisville. And this brings us to kind of the shots I had in mind when I when I envisioned this trip. There's a very famous photography spot in downtown Atlanta known as the Jackson Street Bridge. A few years ago, while I was on a work trip, I took a really cool shot and it's, it's, it's not that remarkable. Tons of people have taken shots like this, but you know, a really cool shot for me. And when I saw this walkway in Louisville, as I'd done a number of work trips to Louisville in the years past as well, and every time I'd seen that walkway in Louisville, I thought, you know, this would make a cool spot to attempt that same Jackson Street Bridge shot, city off in the distance, and the long light trails um, of the cars moving on the highway. I didn't know if it would be possible, but I thought it would be really cool to try. Anyway, by the time I got up there to take these shots, the sun had mostly set, and I kind of had to walk through the landscaping to get to the, to the edge of the walkway. And you'll notice there's a metal fence um, on, it's on both sides of the walkway, but you'll see the bars, unfortunately, on both sides of these shots where I'm having to you know, push my lens right up to the fence to try to see through. And unfortunately, I wasn't completely successful. Of course, I could crop in, but we believe in honesty and transparency on this channel. I took the shot in both directions because I'm a giver. Anyway, after I took these shots, I continued wandering aimlessly through the city um, like some sort of redneck Ansel Adam. And by pure blind luck, I stumbled on one of my favorite shots that I took the entire night and one of my favorite shots of this year. So I came up on this nondescript um, insurance, insurance sales building. Somebody's gonna correct me in the comments. So it's this modern office building, kind of modern aesthetic. And what was interesting about the building is a corner of the building was like cut out. They designed the building to kind of look like this corner of the building was missing and it was only held up by this column. And what made the shot really cool is the lighting kind of shining down. It made for kind of a really atmospheric, moody, dark, kind of desolate looking shot. Not to mention all the lines in the background. So take a look at this shot. I must have moved my camera in every direction. I spent 15, 20 minutes out there moving my camera around trying to get the perfect shot. And unfortunately, this was as good as I could do. All in all, not too bad, not too bad. But after that, I kept walking. My next goal for the evening was to get up on one of Louisville's many bridges and try to get kind of an elevated perspective on the city and perhaps get some interesting shots. But on my way over, my attention was caught by one of these dope Blade Runner looking parking garage gates. When I'm out taking pictures at night, my attention is always drawn to colorful lighting. It makes for really cool shots. And I thought these parking garage gates were just super cool. So check out this shot. As I walked back across town, I haphazardly plopped my tripod down on the corner of the street facing the Yum Center and made this modern masterpiece. 
I'm kidding. I mean, you win some, you lose some. This shot isn't that great, but I wanted you guys to know I don't always bat a thousand either. Frig, I don't even bat 200. And finally, after hoofing it halfway across downtown Louisville, um, I make it to the bridge that I'm looking. I can see it kind of going off into the distance. It, it does, it elevates to 100 feet above the water. A really, really interesting bridge structure. And my goal is to kind of walk out on the bridge and then look back towards the city and see what kind of shots I can make, hopefully incorporating some lot trails. I do have to say though, it's kind of a peculiar feeling to be the middle of the night walking on a bridge like this. And regardless of what my picks would have you believe, the views from out on the bridge were completely epic. So take a look at these shots. So what do we think about shooting Portrait 160 at night in an urban environment like this? Well, I mean, I think if you look at the shots, and I didn't do any other post correction on these images, I downloaded my developed files from the darkroom and I plopped them into this video, right? I haven't color corrected them any at all. So to my taste, these shots are all a little bit orange and we knew this was a daylight balanced film. It's not tungsten balanced. You're gonna get a lot of orange at nighttime with these exposures. After looking at these shots, I do have to say that I prefer the Blade Runner preset Cinestill 800T look to the Portra 160 look. Although admittedly, I think you could probably just dial this down a little bit in post. You could turn the oranges down and then maybe wind up with a pretty similar result. But what's the fun in that? Another thing that's probably worth talking another thing that's worth talking about Portra 160 is the film speed. It's a 160 speed film. Shooting out on a bright summer day, it's actually an advantage to have a slow speed film. But at nighttime, it just makes for really, really complicated reciprocity calculations. For some of those long exposures up on that kind of walkway, uh, my exposure times were super, super long. I'm talking minutes long. Um, it's an exponential curve. Every stop a lot that you're trying to gather past that kind of reciprocity failure point. So some of these shots were just really long exposures. I was sitting there for two or three minutes between shots taking taking these. So all that's to say the additional speed that comes along with Cinestill 800 or Portrait 800 would have been very much welcome. In regards to the image quality of the film, it's great. Look at look at the pictures that I've posted in the video. It's, it's really nice image quality. Kodak advertises on the box world's finest grain color film, color negative film, something like that. It's not for nothing, right? It, it really is a crystal clear sharp film, almost a digital lot quality. It is razor sharp. I guess that's your reward for suffering through those really long shutter speeds as you get a crystal clear um, razor sharp film as a result with not a lot of noise. Everyone knows about McDonald's for their tasty french fries, Big Macs, and the the McRib. But did you know that at one point McDonald's made film cameras and film? Sort of. The only problem with that was that was 30 years ago and I was three, so I didn't have a time machine. So I hopped on eBay to see if I could find one of those old cameras. Lo and behold, I was able to find a sexy lime green variant of McDonald's's wonderful Concord square shaped camera. So I bought the camera. It came in its original packaging with a, a little card that said what, what the camera was. And McDonald's Canada sold these cameras as a way to raise funds for a charity. So no matter the performance of the film and the camera, we won't be too hard on McDonald's. But I bought the film. It was in its plastic baggie with a roll of film. And so you know, and this is not the original film that I shot, and I have a roll of film similar to the roll of film that I shot in the McDonald's camera. It's a roll of Lomography Tiger 200 film. Now the roll of film inside the McDonald's camera, I have no idea who made it. The film was completely indescript, no markings of any sort, but this roll of 110 film is very similar. 110 film is a cartridge based film. You can see I'm holding it up right now. The film is completely encased in plastic and there are 24 exposures per roll. And they did sell it in other variants, but the one that I had did have 24 exposures on it. And to make one thing perfectly clear before we get too deep into the video, I have no idea how this roll of film was stored. The eBay seller that I bought the camera from made no bones about it that he also had no idea how the film was stored. But after we take a look at some of my images that I took with the film, we'll have some creative guesses as to how we think the film was stored. That, my friends, is foreshadowing. So I've got the camera with me right here. You can see on the front of the camera, it says Concord. So that tells me that McDonald's did not actually roll cameras off their assembly lines alongside Big Macs. They actually outsourced it to this camera company called Concord. Concord was a Chinese camera company founded in 1982 and they specialized in making super, super low-end, plasticky, fantasticky cameras like the like the camera from McDonald's. From the build quality, you would never guess that these cameras were made in China, exported overseas, and sold under various brand names, Concord being one of those. So I took Old Yeller out into the wild and began shooting what I only hoped would become modern, artistic, abstract masterpieces with the Concord Speciale. So I cocked the camera with this little thing here, and for the first shot, 
I didn't even know if the camera was firing because the shutter was so limp and uninspiring. I'm sure that a girlfriend has said that about me. <laughs> but anyway, I wasted one of my precious, moldy, crusty exposures um, on this masterpiece. I was just trying to make sure that the shutter was actually firing. And it was. Sadly, it was. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the images. Holy crap, all these images look like Smurf feel. So the first image, I'm not sh sure how I was trying to compose this. There is a flower in the shot, lots of grass, but you can see there is a, there is a very distinct blue hue um, all over the frame. <laughs> this shot vaguely looks like some water. There's lots of weird artifacts. You can see these little, this little splotchiness, kind of a magenta cast as well. Just absolutely dreadful. Oh, there's water. I, again, I don't know what the focal length of this was because that doesn't even look like I composed the shot in any sort of way. Again, there is a uh, artistic rendition of a creek with lots of blue, blue shifted colors and um, this little bridge. Again, not very much artistic merit in that shot. Here is one as well. This is this looks a little more sensible. Um, you can see I was going for something. This image actually doesn't look as Smurf Smurfy land um, as the other ones. Not a wonderful image, but honestly, I wasn't I wasn't going for good images. Um, here's some grass. I don't know what I don't know what the approach was here. It seems like the camera has a tendency to underexpose these shots pretty badly. I'm guessing that's due to the fixed aperture lens. Completely dark. Way underexposed. Just monstrously underexposed. I can see some numbers with lines over top of them. I don't know what that's about. But yeah, you got some lot leaks on here as well. Very blue lot leaks. These numbers are weird. It's like two sixes. I wonder if it's like a message from the devil. Oh, there's like a good shot, right? Like that's that res vaguely resembles a photograph. Look at that. What's up, 110 film? You can see, looking up the creek there, it's got the creek nice and centered. Everything, all the blacks are just completely gone into some sort of magenta, moldy mess. Still, that's not so bad, and I think I can still see numbers and stuff in the background. So that's an interesting effect. We're gonna go with it. There's another shot of the creek. This is one I took in portrait orientation. Again, you can actually see some color. It looks like it was properly exposed. I'm sure something was happening there, but I see some numbers again, upside down. Maybe, maybe another message from the devil. It's like a Ouija board. It's like a Ouija camera, right? Again, just completely, completely dreadful framing here. I had this leading line off into the distance. I didn't properly center it. I wonder if the camera and the lens are like properly aligned or like the film was properly aligned or I, maybe I just suck at photography. That's possible. That's possible. Um, hmm. Hmm. I don't know what's happening here at all. Another picture of the creek, you can see these rocks. I took it in portrait orientation again. Lots of blue, lots of mold. The numbers are still back there in the background. I, I don't know what those numbers are for. Oh, there we go. There's some actual colors again. Um, shooting up this creek, you can see this little bank here. Again, blue, nasty colors. Just, just dreadful stuff here, really. Again, very blue highlights, you can see. The film is very much shifted to the blue end of the spectrum. Looks like I'm propping my feet up, except the lens isn't nearly as wide as you think. Barely got my shoes there and the water. The hallmark of a good photographer is when you put your fingers in the shot. More water, very water forward to this album. Um, here's this cool bridge. Again, just using it kind of as a leading line off into the distance, trailing away. Um, again, very blue, very blue color. Ah, here are those flowers. The only halfway decent shot on the roll. Um, and I can see like an X through there, lots of satanic messaging in the image, mold in the background, um, noise, lots of noise, lots of grain, lots of color shifts. So now that we've taken a look at the images, does anybody want to take a guess how we think the film was stored? So after taking a look at those images, like those were pretty, those were pretty unremarkable, if we're being honest. It looks like the film, at least to my eye, was not not taken care of properly at any point in the last 30 years. Maybe it was stored in a sauna, maybe it was stored in somebody's attic. Either way, the images were absolutely dreadful. And it wasn't just my compositions. <laughs> So talking about the camera a little bit, Concord being known for such photography classics as the M&M's camera and the Crayola camera, this was another hit for them, no question about it. I cannot understand why a company who made cameras this good is still not in business today. Um, the camera, you can hear it, it's very cheap plastic, chintzy plastic. The body is plastic, the lens is plastic, um, every single component in it is plastic. Maybe even that spring is plastic, I don't know. Camera looks crappy, it feels crappy, but it's very small, it's very compact. It's points for points for portability, we like that. Who would this camera be for? First and foremost, probably someone that's blonde. Secondly, uh, maybe children. 
If you want any sort of quality imaging, I'm probably gonna stay away from a camera like this. Although I am going to run a roll of Lomography Tiger 110 through it, and we will feed the camera ample light so that we can see what this camera can really do. 110 film is a very small frame film. It's not gonna yield the resolution, especially when going through a plastic fantastic lens. And I mean, we joked a lot in this video, but in all seriousness, the camera probably wasn't the reason why those pictures turned out so badly. Probably due to the fact that it looked as though the film had been infected with some venereal disease over the past. 30 years. The film was not in good condition. And I think this warrants a small discussion as to why that is. Color negative film is interesting. Like dinosaur bones, the chemicals that they put on photographic film are organic. And so organic chemicals, over time, they degrade. And most companies, when they make color negative film, they're laying down three layers. A red layer, a green layer, and a blue layer. Except for Fuji because Fuji's extra. Um, sometimes their films have four layers. But all that's to say, each layer is more responsive to a different color of light. And you can see that these film, you can see that these images were very much shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, which tells me that the blue layer of the spectrum was probably more resilient, right? And it was the other layers of the film that had shifted and had degraded over the past 30 years of not being taken care of. So what you were seeing was a very, very color shifted film due to the degradation of some of the color layers in the film. And there's a very good lesson in this as well. If you have film and you don't plan on shooting it for a while, throw it in the fridge because Putting your film in the fridge, like your hamburger meat, makes it last long. And if you freeze it, it will last a really long time. So put your film in the fridge, put your film in the freezer, um, and you'll be able to shoot it for a lot longer because it slows the degradation of those color layers and will keep it from having those nasty, nasty shifts that you saw in my images. But this film was 30 years old and it looks every day of it, much like me. But you know, that's one of the cool things about film is trying out new things, taking new films out, and the unpredictability of the results that you can sometimes get. So, so I don't think we're gonna be adding any of these images to my portfolio anytime soon but I had a really good time taking this weird quirky McDonald's camera out checking it out and trying out 110 film for the first time so a few months ago I drove to Lexington to test out Lomography's latest blend of My Chemical Romance and Mountain Dew I had a new roll of their 2021 formula of Lomochrome Metropolis they're currently selling this alongside what we'll call the old variety of Lomochrome Metropolis, but it has slightly different color shifts. Not that you're gonna be able to tell that from these photos. And I mean, I had a great night of shooting. I was walking around vibing just as much as I could for a middle-aged dad, walking around in my Air Force Ones and smelling Joella's hot chicken and taking some thoroughly mediocre photos. I had a really good day, apart from the fact that I nearly crabbed my pants on the way home due to Joella's hot chicken, but that's another story for another day. That was until it came time to roll the film back into its Pokeball. I fired off that 36th exposure, having completed what I thought was a pretty good roll of film. I slapped myself on the back with a job well done and started to rewind, and it kept going and going and going. And then I heard like a slapping sound, not like a good slapping sound, like a, it was this sound. It sounded as though the film was turning and brushing up against something, which was a very unusual sound. And at this point, I kind of thought that I had an idea of what was going on because I'd experienced this issue once before with a roll of Cinesteel that I'd spent God knows how long out shooting with one night. I shot an entire roll of Cinesteel, rewound the film, at least I thought, opened up the back of the Nikon FM2 in the parking lot. Luckily, it was at night, and there was the film. And if, by chance, you're new to film photography, that's not how this is supposed to work. If you ever see unexposed film with the naked eye, you're mostly effed. So I learned my lesson from that role. So I had an idea that that was probably what was going on here. So I drove all the way back from Lexington, got back to my house, and started trying to figure out how I was gonna get this film out of the back of the camera, and what I was gonna do with it. So I stepped inside my closet and kind of started rounding up some supplies. So I didn't have a dark bag, but I did have one of those generic Walmart Yeti knockoff coolers. With my hillbilly ingenuity, I determined that this would work just fine for a dark bag. The trouble was I couldn't really get my hands down inside to work with the camera and the film with it unzipped on the top. So in my infinite wisdom, I crammed a sweater down into the top of the bag. Although I thought my closet was dark, it might better be described as subdued lot. I know guys, I'm an idiot. Feel free to leave me a comment about just how dumb this is. Anyway, I stuck my hands down in the top of the cooler, I popped open the back, and like a high schooler on his first car date, I started feeling around. So just like I thought, the canister was on one side and the roll of film was wound up on the other. Plainly not how any of this is supposed to work. So my first idea was to try to get the film to go back inside the film canister. 
and it went just about exactly like you thought it would have went. You can't really put toothpaste back in the tube. You also can't really put film back in the canister if it's came detached from the canister. That brings me back to what I think the problem was. I think when I was rewinding the film, maybe I cranked it too hard or I put too much pressure on it and detached the film from the canister. Usually the film is attached to the canister on the inside with some really strong adhesive. It's this adhesive that lets the little winder on the film canister take up the film and pull it back inside the canister. So obviously if that comes detached, the likelihood of you getting the film to wind back around the canister is not very high, as I found out. So I'm fiddling around with the canister down in the bag. I put it down, flip it, and reverse it, and can't get the film to go back inside the canister. And as I'm working, I'm constantly aware of the risks of the light leaks, and I know that I'm only keeping the light out with a sweater on top of the cooler, and I'm starting to get very nervous that I'm messing up the film. I thought this was gonna be a quick process, but no, I'm having to move a lot, I'm starting to get sweaty, and I'm afraid I'm ruining these shots. And some of them I scratched up pretty bad. After fumbling around for a while inside the bag, I thought it was time to go back to the drawing board. My next idea was to grab a film canister and to try to get the film wound up tight enough to go down inside a black film canister. So that's what I did and luckily I was a little more successful with that. I pulled the black film canister out of the bag with the film inside and I guess it was mission accomplished. I scrawled out some roll notes on a post-it note and I taped it to the canister and sent it off to the dark room. Now, before I show you these images, I want you guys to know that I gave them my best effort. I really did have good intentions. I wanted to review this new Lamography emulsion. This was a new emulsion that came out while I've been doing my YouTube channel. I don't get a lot of opportunities to review films like this, and unfortunately, I just screwed it up. But here are the pictures. So the first image here that you see, it looks a little bit like a Talking Heads album cover, or in other words, a uh, dog crap. The shot's a little better. It's way overexposed, but still pretty cool look. Here's another shot. I can't really tell what in the heck is going on, but you see this little pattern, this little hatching pattern. I'm reasonably convinced that that is light penetrating the cooler and uh, shining onto the film as I'm working with it. So that's why the light leaks are inconsistent and have that weird pattern. Apparently, to my surprise, my cooler wasn't light tight. Can you believe that? Here's another modern masterpiece here. Looks like the side of a building. And this shot's pretty dang cool. It's way overexposed. Again, lots of light leakage, but not a bad shot. Opera House in downtown Lexington. Slightly overexposed, but honestly, this is a usable shot. This door, way overexposed, really light leaky. Just a, This is just a shot of the Lexington skyline. Way, way light leaky, way overexposed. You can see, you can see kind of a double exposure effect with another piece of film laying over top of the shot here. This shot turned out mostly normal. It's really weird how some of the shots are turning out pretty darn normal and the other ones are a lot leaky. Hey, there's a cool shot. That's not bad at all. It's the new Rep Arena facade. Another very normally exposed shot. Not too bad there. The awning from the Kentucky Theater. Um, and Jody is being told she's loved. Here's one of good old Honest Abe. Actually, a couple shots of Honest Abe. The back of some building, way overexposed. These horses, we're big on horses in Lexington. We love horses. A weird mural, weird lot leak pattern here. Not too bad though. Here's a pretty cool shot of the sun setting through this electrical equipment. Cool, pretty cool shot. And here's a here's just an ab abomination of a shot. You can see the, that weird pattern again coming through. A few of these shots just got dicked. I'm not sure what's happening here at all. That looks vaguely like a house in a snowstorm. Here are some more buildings downtown with a, an exceptional lot leak pattern. Um, more dog crap. Here's Jonathan Stevens. What's up, Jonathan Stevens? Looks like this one I didn't even try to focus properly. So that's cool. Terrible composition. Why even shoot that? I actually finished up a few of these shots in downtown Louisville, and here's the best shot on the roll. And it's this dude who is skateboarding. I just asked him if I could take a shot, and luckily it turned out really cool. The buildings and the skyline in downtown Louisville. And this is what happens when you try to cram your film back into the film holder. Um, it gets all mangled and garbled, if you're, if you're wondering. So I think, I think we can all here agree, not my finest work. Again, mistakes were made. But this video and these pictures illustrate kind of the dichotomy of film, the good and bad. The good in that you get these really cool effects. Like some of those shots were honestly maybe even a little better because of the light leak, like the skateboard shot. Some of those downtown shots, um, they're really vibey and cool. That unpredictability element of film goes a long way. Sometimes makes for some really interesting shots. But again, not my finest hour with these shots. The unpredictability of film can oftentimes lead to some really cool results, although you won't find many of those in here. So every year my family goes on vacation to Daytona Beach, Florida. 
which is super cool if you like NASCAR or driving on the beach. And as it turns out, I like both of those. I'm just kidding, NASCAR sucks. But anyway, I thought this would be a great occasion to test out my Contax G1 on the beach. I'd reckon that some salty air would be just what the doctor ordered for those 1980s model electronics inside the Contax. But this was a family trip, so I thought the Contax G1 would be a great choice because it was autofocus. The shots wouldn't require too much thinking. So I escaped Public Defender hell for a few days and then met my family at the beach. Getting down there would require me driving through the night through the Kakalakis and Georgia. I drove all through the night fueled by nothing but monster energy and my chemical romance. After all of about three hours of sleep, I woke up and I was primed and ready to head to the beach. Before I went outside though and met my kids at the beach, I did load a legendary film stock into my camera. On this trip, I would be shooting nothing but Kodak Gold 200. Daytona is a city that has kind of a weird aesthetic, right? It has the pastel colors and the condos of Miami, but it's also just a little bit more redneck with big trucks and rebel flags and all of that nonsense. But I thought the warmer tones of Kodak 200 would go really well with that vintage aesthetic of Daytona Beach, Florida. We didn't really do a lot on our first day at the beach, but I did manage to get some cool shots, and I do think that the film suited the environment. Awesome. What's better than watermelon on the beach? Maybe don't answer that. Anyway, we cut up a watermelon for my kids. I thought the film did a great job capturing the colors of the watermelon. That night, I wanted something for dinner, a little more cultural, so we decided we would eat it out back. Anyway, we got checked in at the restaurant and we snapped these pictures. This is me and my daughter. No, we're not actually Oompa Loompas, but that does bear some explanation. This is a daylight balanced film, and we were very, very clearly under tungsten lighting in these shots. The film being tungsten balanced really shifts the images towards the orange end of the spectrum, and that's something that you're gonna have to think about if you are shooting this film in environments where there's gonna be tungsten light present, um, you are gonna get that very orange color shift in your images. Another thing that's worth pointing out is this is a relatively slow speed film as well. At ISO 200, although I was using a pretty fast lens, F2, the ISO ISO speed of 200 was still not very fast and I was shooting at pretty low shutter speeds in a lot of these images. The next morning it was back to building sandcastles and all that BS before, after a couple days, we decided to head back to Kentucky. So a few details about the film, much like Ric Flair, Kodak Gold 200 had its heyday back in the 80s and 90s. This was what moms used at soccer games, baseball games, football games. This is the kind of film that your life would most likely be chronicled in. It was a low cost film at the time. It's still a relatively low cost film relative to the other films, but it isn't marketed as a Kodak professional film. It's kind of a second tier film for Kodak, but first in our hearts. But my overall impression of using the film was this is a really, really good film. Very versatile, lots of different use cases for this film. It's pretty neutral in terms of color. It's a little more orange than the Fuji films. Fuji seems to be a little cooler. Gold 200 seems to be a little warmer. So that's something that's worth bearing in mind as you decide which low cost film to use. I think the sharpness of the film is really good as well. Some of that can be attributed to the really nice Carl Zeiss optics that I was using with my Contax camera, but the film is also really sharp too. Being a low speed, ISO 200 film, not a lot of grain present. Price is right as well. I picked up three rolls of this film off Amazon for $19.95. So at roughly six bucks a shot, it's really hard to beat this stuff. If I had two words to describe the film, I would say effortlessly vintage. You can see by the warm coloring of the film, you can see by the warm coloring of the film, it does make your images look very nice, very vintage, very warm. 
I think a lot of folks who get into film photography want that vintage look. Well, this film is gonna give that to you. That naturally warm sepia look, and it's gonna make your images look great. Some negatives to the film, that coloring is not gonna be suitable for all applications. This is probably not a film you're gonna wanna use for portraiture. It's probably also not a film you're gonna wanna use for landscapes. Um, with films like Velvia and Ektar offering much higher saturation, those are probably gonna be the go-to choice for landscapes. And Kodak has their portrait line of films marketed towards rendering nice skin tones um, if you wanna take portraits. So this is a kind of film that exists in no man's land. But the benefit of that is it's a film that's really well-rounded. You can do a lot of things with it. I think this is a great casual film to document your life with. Just like those moms back in the 90s, this is a wonderful choice. All of us at this point have seen those weird Fuji disposable cameras with the plastic shells on the outside lining the shelves at our local supermarket. It being summertime and time for a little vacation, I bought two of them and headed to the land of palm trees and Ron DeSantis, apparently, you know, to test them out. I've always wanted to go to a place called Wikiwachi State Park. I swear to God, that's what it's called. It's a state park in Florida known for a couple things, mermaids and freaking manatees. So I decided I wasn't leaving that park without getting in the water with a mermaid or a manatee. When we all got to the park, I opened up the cameras, one for myself and one for the much more capable hands of my daughter. Yes, whatever. We picked up our kayaks and shoved off, keeping a keen eye out for alligators. Bella. What? Love you. Love you too. These Fuji underwater cameras are pretty simple. They're a lot like a regular disposable camera, except instead of coming with 400 or 200 ISO speed film, these come with 800 speed film. And they're notable because they have that hard plastic shell around the outside and these big, chunky, obnoxious controls so you can operate them underwater. And as we continue on our little adventure, I'm gonna show you some of the photos along the way. We paddle down the river in our kayaks, seeing all manner of wildlife, turtles, fish, birds, all sorts of things. But no manatee. Eventually, we found a clearing in the water, a spot where it was nice and clear, and we decided to take a swim. And that's where I tried my hand at my first photos, trying to get a good self-portrait underwater. And that's where we're gonna run into the first issue with the camera. So let's take a look at these. You ready to take some pics? Yeah, come on. Are we gonna go swim in that water, Bailey? Yeah, we can go swim. Do you want to? Yeah. Let's go swim. Okay. Taking a look at the photos I took here, number one, it appears that I'm slightly out of focus. We'll forgive the camera for that. We know it's a disposable camera. They have plastic lenses. They're not known for the highest image quality, but my problem with the camera is a little more fundamental, and that's the focal length. You can see that it is very, very close. Now, obviously, I'm holding the camera at roughly arm's length away from my face, but it appears to be a pretty long focal length. This means that when a camera like this is taken underwater, the effective focal length is a little longer. So you're gonna pull the camera out of the water and things are gonna appear just a little wider. Um, and you're gonna put it under the water and things are gonna be a little tighter, resulting in the constrained focal length and a little bit too close crop um, for taking self portraits like I attempted here. So that's something worth noting, not just for these cheap disposable cameras, but for cameras in general. If you wanna get serious about underwater photography, there's something called a dome port that you would wanna use. That's a rounded viewing port that can help compensate for some of that focal length gain that you get underwater. Here's a photo of my dad and my daughter, and you can see you've got some very typical Fuji colors here. Maybe they're just a little warmer than normal, but they are still very blue. Here's a picture of my feet trying to walk on some slimy log underwater. And then here's a picture of my son walking into the edge of the water. And you can see when the camera's outside of the water, the, the images look pretty nice. The colors are nice and very realistic and the lighting is good enough. 
on the day that we were out shooting, it was a partly cloudy day. So some of the images are gonna be from under modeled clouds, and then some of the images are gonna be bright sunlight. So that was just the lighting conditions that we had to deal with on that day. This shot right here looks to be a real attempt at just an underwater photo. I think I was wanting to see how much resolution I could get trying to take a picture of the bottom with the camera. And as you can see, there are a couple things kind of decreasing the image quality here. The first being, it's a little dark. You can see there isn't a ton of light there. The camera says right on the box, shoot an abundant light. I probably didn't have enough light to really pull this shot off but it's also the lower resolution of the plastic lenses involved in the camera and the additional layer of the plastic case so, and the murkiness of the water. Not a super high resolution shot. Here's an image of me doing my best underwater impression of a chipmunk. Here's a photo of my mom expertly piloting her kayak down the river. And here's an underwater photo of me taking a picture of some bubbles. Here's another shot looking down the river, and you can see kind of the lighting conditions here. Very cloudy, at least in this photo. And that cloud cover didn't help with fixed aperture camera. Disposable cameras like this, they have a fixed aperture, and it's a very tiny aperture. And, that, and that's to keep the camera simple. Not a lot happening inside the camera. There isn't much going on. Keeps it simple, keeps the camera cheap, easy to manufacture, and keeps everything in focus. If you're shooting at a high enough f-stop, then everything's gonna appear in focus. And that's the way these cameras work. So they don't have to have autofocus mechanisms. They don't have to have aperture mechanisms. They just use a really tiny aperture that simplifies their operation a lot. But there are some drawbacks. Being at, with a tiny aperture, not a lot of light can get into the camera. And you see the drawbacks of that in some of these images. Again, like I said, with the cloud cover, this image appears pretty dark. Here's a photo of my daughter standing in the edge of the water. Again, looks like we had a little better lighting here and everything looks nice. So what conclusions can we draw from these photos that we've taken with these two Fuji disposable underwater cameras? Well, first and foremost, these cameras need a lot of light to be able to deliver really nice images. You could see that when the lighting was okay, the cameras actually produced pretty good images. The colors were nice, the saturation was good, and even the resolution was good. But as the light started to fall off, the cameras just fell to pieces. So that's something to be aware of. If you're shooting these cameras, you're gonna need a ton of light. Maybe don't even consider bringing them if it's even gonna be a partly cloudy day. But the cameras are really nice and darn it, the price is right on them as well. They're 15 or 16 bucks, really cheap cameras. And let's talk a little bit about the value proposition of these cameras. They're like 16 or 17 dollars. They're a little more than a regular disposable camera. That's due to that plastic case that you get on the outside. But it is the cheapest way to get into underwater photography without spending an arm and a leg. It doesn't take very long doing a little research on the internet, finding a case for your nice digital camera. You can spend two, three hundred on the low end a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars on the high end. So for somebody who just wants to take a casual approach, um, just get a couple snapshots underwater. This is one of your best ways to get underwater photos. So while these may not be the highest quality photos that you've ever seen in your life, these cameras definitely have something to offer if you just want to grab a couple of shots underwater, mess around. Super cool cameras, even if the image quality isn't all that great. And if you like cameras that don't have great image quality, why else would you be at a photography channel? Check out this video of me shooting a 110 film camera that I bought from McDonald's and shooting the 30 year old film that came with it. But as always guys, thanks so much for watching. Today, we're leaving the blue grasses of Kentucky for the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, and we're taking three rolls of Portrait 400 with us, along with my Contax G1. Welcome back to Overexposed, where sometimes I like to sleep in the back of my Prius, pee in a water bottle, and watch Dragon Ball Z. So I've been planning this trip to Colorado for quite some time, and to be frank, it's a trip that I've wanted to take for most of my adult life. I'm a public defender, and it's really hard for me to miss an entire week of work. So I had to do my district court docket on Monday in Clay County District Court, filled up my water bottles, gathered my clothes and food and whatnot, and got my car completely ready to go. I even mowed my yard. All in preparation of getting ready to leave after court on Monday. So after court was over on Monday, I stripped down in the back of my car, put on some more casual clothes, and headed towards St. Louis, which was where my first stop would be. So I slept in my car that night and then decided I was going to drive all the way across Kansas and into Colorado. But on my way through Kansas, I was going to stop at every important photography location.
being that there were no important photography destinations in Kansas, I stopped once for gas and then continued on into Colorado. As I crossed the border from Kansas into Colorado, it wasn't long before on the horizon I could see the the little tops of the mountains starting to appear on the horizon. And, and that's when the real sense of adventure started to kick in. I can honestly say that I am hardly ever happier in my life um, than when I'm on my way somewhere new. This is the first time I've been to Colorado. It's that exhilaration, getting to see new things, getting to be out on the road, and frankly, to not be bound by my work obligations. I'm a public defender, the job's really hard, hundreds and hundreds of clients, really important cases, death penalty cases, murder cases, all this terrible stuff, right? And just to be able to get away for a few days, there's no feeling like it. After a combined 22, 24 hours of driving, I made my way into Colorado. And before long, I arrived at Estes Park, which was the entry into Rocky Mountain National Park that I was gonna take. So I went straight away, went to the visitor center and bought my park pass so I could come and go in the park as I pleased. After getting my park pass, I noticed that the sun was starting to, to kind of go behind the mountains and we were on our way to a decent sunset. There were a few clouds in the sky. So I got back in the Prius and I headed up the mountains didn't really know, hadn't, hadn't planned on being able to use any of this day. I got on a road, looked like it was generally going up inside the national park and made my way around the mountains. Turns out that I made a pretty good choice and there were all manner of scenic overlooks and pullouts along the way up there. Continued on my way, jumping out and taking pictures furiously as the light changed and the sun continued to go down. Check out these photos. When I made my way up to the top to an honest to God Alpine region, right? Like still, it's July, right? I took this trip in July and there's still snow on the mountain. It was getting dark and it had been a long day of driving. So I found my spot for the night, a little parking lot near the visitor center that I don't know if we're allowed to camp in. And I and started making camp for the night. Having left Eastern time and now I was on mountain time, by the time eight o'clock rolled around nine o'clock, I was more than ready for bed. So I had an early night that way the next morning I could get out, beat the crowds and hit the trails early. The trail that I'd selected to go on for the next day was a trail called the Dream Lake Trail. And it's one of the Alpine lakes in the Rocky Mountains National Park. It's not a terribly long hike. I wanna say two, two and a half miles, something like that. But it's a really cool place to watch the sunrise. Not because you're actually watching the sunrise, but because you're seeing the warm light on this really rocky face of the mountains. I was up the next morning by probably four o'clock and I was easily on the trail hiking by five. On the trail, it was pitch black dark, and as I set out hiking on the trail, I was being guided only by the, the light coming out of the end of my, camp, my cell phone camera. In my infinite preparedness, I didn't have a headlamp or a flashlight. So here we were, relegated to using the cell phone light. Eventually though, it didn't take long before I started to notice that there was just a little amber reddish color starting to appear off on the horizon. And it was at this point that I was able to start to appreciate the beauty of the place that I was in. And while I'd done the math in the car the night before, this is where I kind of was confronted with a choice because there were actually a series of lakes. There were actually three. It started making me a little bit panicky. Seeing that the sky was already changing colors and the light levels were increasing, I was starting to get worried that I was gonna miss sun. So I looked at the numbers again, realized that sunrise was still supposed to be 30 or 40 minutes away. I dropped it into gear and really tried to make my way up the trail. and I made it to the famous Dream Lake just in time. And I think I used all of the rest of my first roll of portrait right here.
After finishing up with the sunrise at Dream Lake, I put a new roll of Portrait 400 in my camera, and then I was confronted with what to do next, right? I'd planned to do Dream Lake. I had some things planned for that evening. Really hadn't thought about what to do next. So I saw some people hiking on up the trail, and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna continue up the trail as well. Uh, there was just one little problem, and this was something I hadn't planned for. Big shock that I didn't, that I didn't plan for something. But I was starting to get a dull headache. Me being a mountain man in eastern Kentucky plainly is not the same thing as being a mountaineer in Colorado. I think our mountains here at their maximum ebb are like 2,500, 2,800 feet. And at this point, I'm probably well over 11,000 or 12,000 feet. So I was getting a little bit of altitude sickness. And without spoiling the end of the video, let's just say it wouldn't be the last time. <laughs> but I digress. I continued up the trail and snapped some really cool photos of this, this wonderful creek. And while we had already had sunrise proper, the morning light was just absolutely magical at this point. And these are the moments, at least for me, where I really feel alive. I really feel like I'm, I'm doing something. Think back to my day job and how difficult it is and how it's kind of a slog. And I'm able to go up here in these mountains and just be so free. But I was just at my maximum ebb. I was so happy. As I continued up the trail, I saw this like gray water, right? This water that was like a chalky, chalky gray. I mean, I mean, it looked like something out of Final Fantasy. And I had to stop there for a moment. Um, I put my hands in the water and I scooped the water out and I could see the particulate in the water. The water was so cold and so clear, but it had this gray haze to it. Take a look at some of these photos to see what I mean. After that, it was later in the day, so I decided to make my way back down the mountain. And after I got back down, kind of the strangest thing happened. Like, it was a really weird kind of sensation that came over me. I was really tired and honestly thought I was getting sick. So there's a really big parking lot in Estes Park near the McDonald's. There were quite a few folks already in the parking lot by the McDonald's. Um, Subarus and, and van life, like conversions in the parking lot. So lots of folks doing this, but I parked my Prius in that parking lot climbed in the back of the car and decided to take a nap. I really wasn't feeling all that well. I really wasn't feeling all that well. And it hadn't occurred to me that it was altitude sickness. After taking a few hour nap in the parking lot of the McDonald's like a homeless person, I got up and decided it's time to go get some pizza. And at that point, I used the One Bite app. It's Dave Portnoy's app that helps you find and rate pizza places to find a pizza for dinner. And man, I don't know if I was just really hungry because I didn't eat like a substantial meal after the hike or that it was really the best pizza that I've ever had. But I went to Antonio's Real New York Pizza in the Anestes Park and I swear to God, in my review on the One Bite app, you can see a 9.0, right? I'll, I'll show it on the video. The best pizza that I've ever had. Super, super good. So if you're in Estes Park, you want good pizza, Antonio's, that's the place to be. After having the pizza, it was time to go make camp for the night. After making camp, went to the back of my car, watched some Dragon Ball Super, and went to bed. The next morning, I decided to do some more sunrise photography, so I was up and at it, broad and early.
If I have one prevailing memory of that morning, taking those sunrise photos, is that I was really, really freaking cold. Um, I was in shorts, and it was like freaking 30 degrees, and the wind was blowing like a thousand miles an hour, and I thought I was going to freeze to death, so I was really suffering from my art in these photos. So my next goal on this trip was to go to Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park not as widely known as the Rocky Mountains National Park, but it's a place that I've wanted to go for a while anyway. I thought the pictures that come out of this place are really cool. But it also would give me a unique opportunity to drive most of the way across the state. I decided to, to, to take that day, allocate that day to driving to Black Canyon of the Gunnison. And let me tell you, what an amazing drive that was. I went over mountains and streams and saw old buildings, dirt roads and cows and farms and more mountains and more streams and more bridges. Just an absolutely delightful day. I, I loved my drive across the state. Eventually at about two o'clock, I made my way to Black Canyon of the Gunnison. I bought my visitor's pass there and went inside. And for your own edification, there really isn't that much to do there. Black Canyon of the Gunnison, at least from what I could see, consisted mainly of this really, really beautiful canyon. The views are fantastic, but it's mostly just a road and some photo opportunities. There isn't any real consequential hiking, at least that I could see. So Black Canyon of the Gunnison offered some really, really cool photos. Check these out. As I was in Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, the weather conditions started to change pretty dramatically. I could see a huge storm system moving in and eventually a few drops of rain. So with that kind of foiling any prospect of capturing sunset, which was what my goal was, I, I was kind of positioning myself for sunset photos in Black Canyon, um, I decided to leave the park and go on to my next destination. And after that, I made my way back to near Leadville, Colorado, and it was time for dinner again, and the weather was just dreadful at this point. And I made my way into a subway. And I know you guys are probably judging me pretty hard, but like being, I'm not a foodie. I don't go to these places and try to like, eat really expensive bougie food that's that's not what i'm into but anyway had subway found my camp spot for the night and tucked in for an early bedtime the next morning was poised to be my most consequential day of the trip yet and that was because i decided that i was going to hike mount elbert in colorado which if you didn't know is the highest mountain in the contiguous us that's basically excluding all the big crap that's in alaska but anyway i hadn't really been working out i'd been running very very infrequently so i wasn't in the greatest fitness I'm setting into this journey. So the Mount Elbert Trail. So the Mount Elbert Trail is, especially for somebody who hasn't been running all that much, a pretty difficult trail, right? I think of the 14ers in Colorado, it's not like the worst. There's a lot more challenging trails than this one, but it's a 10 mile hike, 5,000 feet of elevation gain. So trail's nothing to sleep on. And it's also worth considering that this is done at elevation, right? This is a 14er, it's 14, 14,400, 14,500 feet tall, really big, really difficult mountain. So it was gonna be a really challenging day. Woke up the next morning, checked the weather, and thankfully the rain had stopped. It was still wet from raining the, the day before, and they were giving rain in the afternoon. Looks like I was gonna have a really nice window to try to hike Mount Elbert. So the next morning, loaded up my stuff, fruit snacks, crackers, water bottles, soda, like all the things that I would need for freaking 10 miles of hiking. Once again, it was really dark when I got on the trail, but the parking lot was full. Um, so there were lots of other folks with the same idea as me, but getting there early, I got a spot and I was able to get on the trail. And that morning as the sun started to rise, I was treated to some of the most beautiful views that I've ever saw. Hiking a mountain like this is such an enjoyable experience because you meet so many cool people on the trail. And I think that hiking kind of self-selects cool people, right? You're kind of ambitious people. So these are, these are 
reasonably successful people from other walks of life. Just a really fun time getting to know a lot of the folks. I met like a teacher from Hawaii. I met a guy from North Carolina who was super cool. I met a park service worker who was working on a bit of the trail. He had spent some time in Moorhead, Kentucky. Lots of really cool folks on the trail with really cool stories. But as I continued up the mountain, I was getting tired. So just taking a little bit of a breather. So just taking a little bit of a breather here. Beautiful morning here on Mount Elbert. Sitting at about 13,000 feet. Got about a mile to go before I get to the summit. Trouble is the whole mile is basically on a 45 degree angle uphill. So could be a lengthy process. Like I said, it's about 7.30, threat of rain at noon. So better get moving, but I'll keep you guys updated. These hillbilly lungs are not properly acclimated. <laughs> Pretty soon, as we got close to the summit, the rain started, and then the rain turned into snow in July. So I made it a couple hundred feet from the summit and then I stopped for a snack. Looking back on my hike of Mount Elbert, most of my memories are very fuzzy. I said this to my mom, it's almost like my brain was covered in dryer lint. Um, at 14,000 plus feet, altitude sickness was a real, real problem. I thought I had it earlier in the week, but at this point my head is hurting. I'm getting sick to my stomach. I wanna puke, um, I'm exhausted. And couple that with the rain and the snow and being cold and wet, it was really hard. It was really hard. And perhaps I was a little underprepared. After finishing up with the hike, I turned around, made my way back down the mountain, and it was all but basically a survival situation. It rained and it rained and it rained and it rained all the way down the mountain. I was soaked to the bone and I was bitterly cold. And in fact, some of my images have water damage because the water soaked through my backpack and got into one of my rolls of film. Pretty soon though, much to my relief, I was back in my car and I was impossibly tired. I'd worn jeans on the trip and at this point the jeans were completely stuck to my legs. They were soaking wet. My shirt was soaking wet, my jacket was soaking wet and it was like 35 degrees, 37 degrees, like really cold. And I just rolled around in the back of my car until I could get my jeans off and put, put, some, put some dry clothes on. After getting some dry clothes on, I had one thing on my mind and that was food. So I made it out of there, got something to eat, just a snack from the, the things that I'd brought with me, and then I found a parking lot and took a nap. After waking up from the nap, it was decision time. I had to figure out what I was gonna do with the rest of the day. I'd been watching the weather because we'd had quite a few storms rolling through, and my next stop on my trip was gonna be Great Sand Dunes National Park. My intention was to go there and hike that evening and then get up the next morning and do some sunrise hiking. So I left Mount Elbert and headed towards Great Sand Dune National Park. And again, just a really, really cool drive. Pulled into Great Sand Dune National Park that evening, and once again, I'm kind of in the same situation. I snapped a few images, but you could see off in the horizon, you could see off on the horizon, there were clouds rolling in. Looked at the weather, and they were giving rain that evening, and then rain the next morning. And the next morning was when I decided to leave. So at that point, I took all the photos I could take, finished up my role of Portrait 400, and made an executive decision to go ahead and head back towards Kentucky. I didn't see much use for me laying in the car that night and laying in the car the next morning if I wasn't going to be able to hike or do anything there anyway. And that's when I headed back towards Kentucky with three completed rolls of Portra 400 and a lifetime of memories. When I'm able to take trips like this, I'm, I'm so thankful. The ability to go and get away for a few days and to have these experiences are just so valuable. I really enjoy the time alone. I really enjoy the time being able to focus on the things that I enjoy, photography, creating, um, seeing new things, having new experiences. Just 
incredibly rewarding. And, you know, I made a video on the channel about the reasons why I quit photography a few years ago. And I'll take a look at that version of Isaac that was broken down and just lifeless. You know, every, every bit of happiness and joy had been kind of sucked out of my life. And I look back at that now and I'm so thankful that I was able to persist and to keep on moving, to keep on doing things and to keep on having these new experiences. Because there was a moment then where I couldn't see it. I couldn't ever imagine going and having a big trip like this and, and, and doing it by myself. But getting back to the place where I can go and have these experiences and do these things, even if I'm doing them by myself, is like kind of the completion of my character arc, so to speak. Like I, I it just, it's really, really rewarding. And I think trips like this, at least for me, they're very important. They're very, and trips like this are just very important to me. Being able to go on these trips and have these experiences is super important to me. So if I could offer any advice to you, do the thing, take the trip, take the ride. Um, you're not going to get that many opportunities. I only get so many, we only get, we only get so many weeks of vacation a year. Use them. Your work will be there forever and it'll continue long after you're gone. Guys, if you thought this video was cool, check out my main trip or my Route 66 trip. And if you like the content that I'm making, subscribe. But as always, guys, thanks for watching. If you thought this really long drawn out video was cool, check out this video I made about the film photography iceberg. It's, a, it's an iceberg chart video. We start at the top with really broad facts about photography, getting to really specific stuff down at the bottom that you may not have ever heard. But as always guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.